would love to give you sermon notes are helpful. Okay, the title of my message is A Heart for the House. I want to talk today about having a heart for the things of God. How many of you know that what you do with your heart is important? You say, yeah, well, what's my heart? I just follow it. No, you direct your heart. That's what the Bible says. It says, guard your heart with all diligence, for from it flow the issues of life. You direct your heart. You decide what your heart's going to go after. And I want to talk to you today about having a heart for the house, having a heart for the things of God, having more of a heart for God. We have free will. Did you notice we're free will, free moral agents? We're not robots. No, your life has not been pre-programmed, pre-motion, everything you do. Isn't that kind of crazy? I know some people believe that, that, you know, I can't, you know, it's all pre-programmed. Really? God pre-programmed Hitler to kill people? God pre-programmed people to rob banks, to murder, to rape? No, God doesn't do that. We have free will. We have free will. You choose. You choose where you direct your heart and what your heart goes after. And the great commandment, according to Jesus, is love the Lord with all your heart. But you see, your heart can go after many things. That's why you have to guard your heart. Guard your heart. Don't let it go after stuff that's going to detract, distract you and keep you away from what's really important in life where the real blessing is, which is in God. Your heart belongs in God. You can't give too much to God. The more you give to God, the more he gives to you. You say, yeah, but I got to do this. I got to do that. That's why Jesus said, seek first the kingdom of God and I'll take care of all the rest of the stuff. Yeah, that's a, that's a faith statement. I understand that. And our tendency is, I got to take care of all this and then someday I'll spend some time with God. And you know what happened? You know when someday comes? Never, never. Because uh, God lets us take care of all this ourselves and it's too much. And then when we say, okay, I'm going I'm to give God the first of my day, the first of my finances, the first of my energy, the first of my thoughts, somehow he takes care of the rest of that and it goes a lot easier. You still have to put in effort, but it goes way, way further. I like what George Mueller, he lived many years ago, he ran an orphanage and he said, I have so much to do every day, I must spend the first three hours with God in prayer or I'll never get it all done. Does that make any sense? It depends on where you're coming from. Oh, I got so much to do today. I'm, I, I can't spend time with God. Guess what? You'll never get it all done. I got so much to do today. I need God's help. I better spend some time with God. So he starts fixing stuff ahead of time and giving me the wisdom to know what to do first and what to know when, do when, and then it'll all work out. Uh, it's all a decision. It's decisions. It's all about decisions. Decisions. I want to talk to you about having a heart for the things of God, having a a heart for the kingdom of God. Having a heart, and remember this is free will, and as I'm talking, you're thinking about where you want to put your heart and whether, you know, what you're going to do with your heart. Having a heart for the will of God. Is the will of God important? Is there the will of God? Didn't Jesus teach us to pray that way? Thy kingdom come, thy will be done. We're praying that on earth as it is in heaven, or more appropriately in my life, the way it's supposed to be. The will, a heart for the will of God? Do you have a heart for the name of God? A heart for the house of God. Well, what is the house of God? Go with me, if you would, to Malachi chapter 3, and we'll, we'll study a little bit. We're going to read a lot of scripture today. Is that okay? Anybody like scripture? You believe the Bible? Okay, we're going to have a little journey. We're going to read a lot of scriptures. Malachi chapter 3, and we're going to learn what is the house of God, both from the Old Testament and the New Testament. So it says this, God speaking to his people. Are we his people? Okay, he's speaking to his people. He says, return to me. Oh, you mean you can depart? Yeah. At this point in their life, is Israel had a long history of coming close to God and going after other things. And God would call them, they'd come back, and then they'd go away. One time, I, when I first became a Christian, we were reading the book of Genesis. And I'm reading the, the Israelites, how they came out of Egypt. God did all these signs and wonders. And then the, they act in the fool in just a few days. And I was sitting there reading that. And I, I said to myself, these are the dumbest people I've ever seen. And God spoke to me and said, I put that in the Bible because you're the same way. You quickly forget what I did for you and you go after other stuff. So when you look at the people of Israel and go, boy, they sure were dumb. No, it's, uh, it's, it's, it's human nature, folks. It's human nature. Return to me. And I would just say today that God's saying to every one of us right now, Return to me. Come on. Come on. Return to me and I'll return to you. Yeah. And so the same thing in the New Testament. We call it the law of the draw in James chapter 4. Draw near to me. I'll draw near to you. Return to me and I'll return to you, says 
the Lord of hosts. But you say, how? How shall we return? And this is interesting. I'm talking about the heart now. Watch what God says. Will a man rob God? What? You can rob God? That's crazy. How could you go into heaven and steal his stuff? <laughs> How can a man rob God? Watch this. Will a man rob God? Yet you're robbing me. And, but you say, How? How have we robbed you? In tithes and offerings. Oh, I, I thought it was just optional. <laughs> if you rob something, that means you took something that didn't belong to you. God said, You're robbing me because you're taking something that doesn't belong to you. Say, but, but I earned it. Where'd you get the strength to earn it? See, that's all tithes and offering is, is acknowledging God as king, as Lord, as owner, as creator. He created me. Now, God did it. I didn't invent this. This is God. This is what he's talking. He's saying, you're robbing me. And all the tithe, what is a tithe? The tithe is the first tenth of our income or increase. Not just income, but increase. When Abraham conquered five kings and took the spoil of war, and he was bringing it back, he told the man, he said, don't touch it, don't touch it. Not yet. I'm going to share it with you. I'm going to give you. I'm going to, I'm going to take the spoils, and I'm going to bless all you guys that went with me. And, and we, we conquered these five kings that had stolen his nephew, and they took all this stuff. And he said, don't touch anything until what? I tithe. He said, we've got to go over here, we've got to go out of our way, and we've got to go to the priest, Melchizedek, and take a tenth of everything and give it, oh, now you can have, now you guys can divide it up. That's what the tithe is, and that's what it shows in our heart. Don't touch it till I give, and what happens is what's left is blessed. Otherwise, the whole is cursed. And Abraham knew that. He said, I don't want this to be a curse, I want this to be a blessing. How do I make sure that first tenth goes to God? So that's what he's saying here. Will a man rob God, yet you're robbing me? You say, how have you robbed you? In tithes and offerings. So a tithe is a tenth of our increase, which is income. You find it on the road. You get a gift. You get a blessing. You sell something for a profit. The inc wherever you increase, you, you just you know, study that out all through Scripture. When you in because you know what? God wants us to increase. So... He blesses the increase, and we take the increase, and we take the first tenth and give it to God, and then it doesn't disappear, and we plant, and we harvest again, and the, it's like a snowball, and it keeps getting better and better. You say, well, that's not working in my life. He's about ready to talk about that. In tithes and offerings, you're cursed with a curse. That's why you never have enough. If you're having problems and you come to somebody and I, I don't know why I'm struggling, I'm working, I'm doing, and I cannot get ahead. This is the first thing you check is have I cursed myself? Because this is the first thing you check. If, then that's the problem right there. And then nothing's going to fix it if we brought a curse on ourselves. You're cursed with a curse because you're robbing me, the whole nation of you. So, and then, then he shifts, here's the solution. Bring the whole tithe into the storehouse that there may be food in, what? My house. So I read all that for those two words. My house. He said, bring it in. So the tithe goes to God's house. The house of God. Now, I don't want to leave that up. But, but what, what is the house? We're going to see that in, it was very clear in the Old Testament where the house of God was. That was the priest. They performed the sacrifices, the sacraments, they did all this. So you, the house was the temple, and that was the priest. But we don't have the temple, and we don't have priests anymore. So we're going to look at a verse in the New Testament that shows us where the house of God is today. But I don't want to leave you hanging right there. I want to show you the rest of this verse. Bring the food that there may be food. So the tithe is for food in the house, to supply the house, to feed the house. That, you know, this house, the house of God, that the lights can be on, that the salaries get paid, that we can buy the things that we need, pay the rent, electric, insurance, whatever. Cookies for the kids. You know, food in my house. So that's the tithe is for the house. Offering, the first offering they took in the Bible was to build a more permanent structure for the people of Israel. They took up an offer. They didn't use the tithes because the tithes funds the house or supports or maintains, keeps the house going. But when it was time to build a more permanent structure, Moses said, take up an offering. And I love this in that passage when he said, take up an offering. The, the priest came and said, it's too much. They're bringing too much. And he said, send out a decree and say, stop. 
Stop, you're bringing too much. It was more than enough to do what? To build the house, but the tithes maintained the house. The offering built the house. So offerings are for ministry projects. And there's one other type of offering spoken of in the Bible. It's alms. Alms is giving to the less fortunate and to the needy. Be sure you distinguish between the three. Like when you read New Testament and such and such. And he says, when you give alms, <clears throat> that's different than offerings and tithes. All right? So you have those three types of giving. Bring in the food, that there may be food in my house, and test me now. And this says the Lord of hosts. Look, look at the heart of God. What does he want to do? See if I will not open for you the windows of heaven, heaven and pour out for you a blessing, a blessing. See, he doesn't want the curse. And how do you break the curse? You don't rob God. You, give, you, you be sure that the 90% is the, what you keep is blessed. And I'll pour out a blessing until you have just barely enough. Is that what it says? No. What does it say there? Until it over... That, that's the nature of God. The nature of the devil is to always be stealing. You never have enough. The nature of God is overflow. Don't criticize people when it looks like they have more than enough. It might be the blessing of God. Watch it. Just take care of your own life. Then, watch this. Not only is he going to bless me, but what good does it do if somebody gives you $100 and your car breaks and it costs $110? Right? So watch what he says. Not only am I going to open the windows of heaven and pour out a blessing, then I will rebuke the devourer. Do you ever wonder why sometimes things, why does all this, check, again, check, am I robbing God? I've opened the curse. And watch what happens when the curse, the devourer, so that it might not destroy the fruit of the ground. What good does it plant a crop and then the locusts eat it all? Nor will your vine in the field cast its grapes, says the Lord of hosts. So having a heart, you know, you, so your, your heart follows your treasure, Jesus said, right? So when we put our treasure in the kingdom, you put your heart in the kingdom. Having a heart for the house does two things. It opens the windows of heaven and pours out a blessing, and it breaks the curse. So if you're taking notes, there's two fill-in-the-blanks. Those are the fill-in-the-blanks. What does it do? It brings a blessing, and it breaks a curse. That's what the tithe does. It brings a blessing, and it breaks a curse. You say, well, I don't believe that. Fine. It's still the Bible. <laughs> it's still true. It doesn't, it doesn't matter. You say, well, I don't believe in hell. Well, that's fine. It's still a hell. <laughs> There's still a heaven. You know, right? go write your own Bible. I believe God gave us this instruction book to teach us right from wrong and how things work. Now, so now we go to the New Testament, 1 Timothy chapter 3, and we, where's, well, we don't have the temple. We don't have the priests. We're not making the sacrifices. So where's the house? 1 Timothy chapter 3. Paul writing to his son in the faith, Timothy, who at this point is pastoring a church, and he says, I'm writing these things to you, hoping to come to you before long, but in case I am delayed, I write so that you will know how one ought to conduct himself in the household of God, which is the church. So there you have it. Instead of the temple, now we have the church. Church is God's invention, Jesus' invention. He started this replacement. This is a new covenant in the Last Supper, a new covenant in my blood. So instead of the temple and priests, Jesus is the offering. He's the sacrifice. Now we have church. So then we learn from the New Testament how church is supposed to operate. You learn from the Old Testament how the temple used to operate. We're not under the Old Covenant. Don't go back and try to do those things. Just learn from them. Apply them to New Testament realities. So I write so that you know how to conduct yourself in the household of God, which is the church of the living God, the pillar and the support of the truth. So I want to talk about two things today. Number one, I want to talk about giving a special Christmas offering to God to channel our heart. And I want to talk about checking our hearts to see if we're all in with God. How many of you love Christmas? I love Christmas. I always have since I was a little kid. Still love Christmas. Love the lights. Love the Christmas music. So Thursday, uh, Chris, when does Christmas start? The day after Thursday, right? Day after Thanksgiving. That's the way it works in my book. Day after Thanksgiving. Bring it on. Bring it on. And uh, what is that station? One, uh, Joy FM. They start playing, right? The day after Christmas, they start playing 24-hour Christmas music. That's when I start turning my radio on. I start listening to the Christmas. I love Christmas songs. I love everything about Christmas because Christmas is about celebrating what's really important in life. And everybody's doing it. The whole town's jazzed up, lights decorated, they're putting stuff. Uh, man, it, it, people that don't even ever talk about God, they got up Christmas lights. What's Christmas? 
Christmas, Latin Christes Maise. Maise is a celebration, Christ, Christes or Christos, the anointed one, the Messiah. It's a celebration of the anointed one. It's the celebration of the Messiah. It's the celebration of Christ. So every time somebody says Merry Christmas, Merry means joy, a joy-filled celebration of the anointed one and his yoke-breaking uh, power in your life. Whoo, that's some good stuff right there. So Christmas is what it's all about. It's celebrating God. It's celebrating Jesus. It's all about love. I mean, how can it get more pure, more biblical? You say, yeah, well, I don't like the commercialism. Well, why focus on that? Focus on the, on the positive stuff of it. It's about giving. It's about peace. It's about joy. It's about family. It's about serving God. It's about serving others. It's about eating. Come on, somebody. It's about eating. It's about cold weather. A couple cold weather fans here. It's about fires in the fireplace. And most of all, it's about playing bocce with the family. Come on, bocce. How many bocce players we got? All right. See, we're gonna, we always play bocce. If, if you don't know, it's an Italian sport. It's called lawn bowling in America. You throw these balls, and my dad did it, my uncles did it, and I keep doing it. We always play bocce at Christmas, and we're going to practice on Thanksgiving. Me and John, we practice because we take on AJ and Shane. We beat the cheese out of them last year. <laughs> we're going to do it again this year. Christmas, what better time of year. We give, we give gifts. Why? Uh, because the store tells us to give gifts? No, because he gave first. He started this. He started giving gifts. So that's why to celebrate his birth, we give. John Maxwell said, you're never more like God than when you give. You're never more like God than when you give. I love that. So we're going to take a Christmas offering. We're not going to like, take it up. But I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to put this out on a Christmas offering to help us pay for the remodeling of this building. We still have more to do, but we're still paying for what we did. How many of you love this building? <laughs> what a blessing. What an increase. Wow, how good it's been. God is using this building. Do you know, last Sunday in this building, two young people got saved. Well, a college student got saved in the Sunday morning service. He, he never, he's been kind of checking it out for a while and spending time with Michael Cranes and checking out our college group, but he never would come to the building in Micanopy for whatever reason. And last Sunday he came and he responded to the altar call and he gave his life to Jesus. Isn't that wonderful? And I say, God used this building to change. If that was the only person that, I mean, is that worth it? Is it worth it to have that young person, a college student, pray to receive Jesus as his Lord and Savior because of all the hard work and all the sacrifice and all the giving and all the painting and all the cleaning and all the stuff we had to put up with to get in this building. That one young man was worth it. Praise God. And then Sunday afternoon, we had the youth group, or the, the uh, middle school, high school, and some of our uh, high school students and middle students that have been coming with their family for years, they brought a friend of theirs, and he gave his life to Jesus during the small group. <laughs> Hallelujah! That's the way it's supposed to work. The young people inviting their friends that have had no exposure to God or Christianity or the church, and we had a college student and a high school student get saved last Sunday. And we talked about it in lead team meeting. And if we had been in Micanope, neither one of those two would have come. So this building, it was hard getting in here. But we're still paying for it. So that's why I'm asking you to make pray about giving a special offering between now and the end of the year to pay for the stuff that we had to do. It was very expensive. Two young people got saved last week. We had three water baptisms last month. We've had more visitors per month since we've been in here than we've ever had in Micanopy. We had more people join the dream team month by month in, since we've been here than we ever had in Micanopy. We've had more people go to Discovery than we ever had in Micanopy. We had this last time more uh, attendance in the small groups this last small group semester, which is some of them are still going, we had 52 people and five dogs attend small group <laughs> this time in eight different small groups. We started for the first time a homeless feeding small group. 
which has been very exciting. And by the way, they have one more that they're doing. I'm sorry Ray and Stacy aren't here, but you can call them if you want to get on. They're going to do one Wednesday night. It's going to be their last one of the semester for thank a pre-Thanksgiving to bless some people that, that are not going to have much to eat on Thanksgiving. They're going to go out Wednesday night and bless some people. And so we have our first ever, because we're in this building, all this has happened. We have our first ever homeless feeding group. We had our, our um, first ever doggy boot camp. Every church needs a doggy boot camp. Come on, somebody. And maybe one day we'll have a kitty cat boot camp. I don't know if that's even possible. Who knows? 2019, here's facts and figures. Was it worth it? All the work that we put in. In the 2019, so far, at the end of November, the first uh, seven months of the year we were in Micanopy, we saw 10 salvations in the first seven months. Well, praise God for that. That's awesome. Ten people gave their life to Jesus. But in the last three months, we've seen 19 salvations since we've been in this building. So we've gone from 10 people in seven months to 19 people in three months. God is definitely using this building. So I want you to pray about helping us pay it. And there's other stuff that we'd like to do. It was definitely worth it. You know, it was not just a good move. It was a God move. But who knows what the future holds? College students, we're trying to reach over 50,000 students <laughs> every year on that campus. Is that a mission field? Is, is, that, is that worth you know, sacrificing and going, trying to reach the leaders of tomorrow on this campus today? High school, is it worth going to high schools and changing high school students' life? Middle school, is it worth reaching middle school students? Elementary? Preschool, why did I use all those students? Because you, we, we have to, the church has to reach this generation. Because the, the hard, cold facts, disturbing facts are this, that as we, as Christian leaders, get older, we tend to make a church for church people. We tend to make church to accommodate our needs as we get older and the things that we want. And we kind of say, well, we're in control now. And, you know, now we're going to have the church the way we want it. And uh, we really don't care about those young people. Now, I know nobody would say that outright. But the way that church gets worked out, that often happens. And we have made a decision as a church to never let that happen. To always be reaching our young people. To do whatever it takes to reach our young to people. You know, we're going we're gonna to reach. We've made a decision. We're going to reach this generation. We're going to reach this generation. We're not going to lose this generation. We're not going to let the devil have this generation. They're too valuable. You young people, you're too valuable for us to just kind of let you, let the devil have you. You're too valuable. But I'm going to tell you, the devil wants this generation. And if you look around, he's made some big inroads. But I'm going to tell you something else. God wants this generation too. And we're going to be on God's side. We're going to help God. And God's going to win the war. The victory is his. We're going to get this generation. But we must reach this generation. And we will, we've made a decision as a lead team. We'll do whatever it takes short of sin to reach this generation. Whatever it takes, if I have to wear skinny jeans, I'll wear skinny jeans to reach this generation. If some, you told me if you shave your head, this young person will get saved, I'll shave my head if, it, if that's what it means. I've never shaved my head. I don't want to shave my head. But listen, all what I'm talking about is what is it worth for a young person's eternal destiny to be changed from hell to heaven? Would you be willing to do what you're uncomfortable doing to see the young generation saved? Unfortunately, a lot of people say no. I want to keep doing what we've been doing. But I say in this church we're going to do whatever it takes to win this generation. Short of sin. That's the mandate that's upon us. You know, so that's what this Christmas offering is about. Is enabling us to continue to use this building to reach this generation. We need your help to do that. It's very strategic. So I'd like you to just pray about a special offering between now and the end of the year. But I'm also talking about not just giving an offering. I'm talking about something much bigger, something much more important. Where our heart is. What are you living for? I just, I just want to be bold and blunt and ask you to ask yourself, what are you living for? What are you living for? Are we living for this life? That's the temptation. <laughs> the biggest enemy of the Christian life is life it's, it's just everything about life it sucks up all your time and all your energy and I found that you have to be very intentional about 
putting God in your heart and your heart in God. You have to make some quality decisions because if, if you just float down the river of life, you're not going to end up where you want to end up. You're just going to go with the flow. It's countercultural. It's counterintuitive. It's counter comfort. You have to go against it. You have to intentionally force God into your agenda and into your schedule. And if you don't do it, I can tell you, your, what you do every day is where you're going to end up a year from now. I can predict your future by your habits on every day. And if God just happens to get into your life once in a while, you're not going to end up where you want to end up in this life, and you're not going to be what God's called you to be. It's going to take force. It's going to take energy. It's going to take a quality decision on your part. Are we living just for this life or for eternity? Is heaven real? Yeah. Is hell real? Yes. Is eternity important? Do you want to lay up treasure in eternity? Are God's, import, in, uh, God's priorities important to me? That's a question we have to ask ourselves. And in the busyness of my day and everything I'm asking God to help me with, where is God in this? Do I have the same priorities? Do I have a heart for the things of God, for God's house? Matthew 16, 18, Jesus speaking. I say to you, you're Peter and on this rock... I will build my... That's what Jesus is doing right now. He's building my... He said, I will build my church. And watch this. The gates of Hades will not overpower. The gates of hell will not overpower. What does that mean? They're trying. How does he do that? Church is people. So he keeps people from being the church. There's no perfect church. You know why? Because there's no perfect people and church is people. So there's no perfect church because there's no perfect people. Don't expect that. But a lot of people don't go to church. They've been turned off by church because they've been offended. You don't go to church to not be offended. Because there's people there. If, if you're offended in Walmart, you're going to get offended at church. Because there's people, people in Walmart, there's people in church. You don't stop being people when you come to church. The, the reason we offend each other is because we're people. And people aren't perfect. And the imperfect people make mistakes and they hurt each other. You don't go to church to not get offended. You go to church to learn how to overcome the offenses of life and how to deal with offenses properly. That's where you come to church. You don't come to church with this unreal expectation that, well, if I go to church, oh, there's all those perfect people there. Really? How about you? No. You don't want to go to a church with perfect people. I don't want a church of perfect people. If the church was perfect people, I couldn't work here and you couldn't come here. Come on. So if we're not perfect, there's still going to be crud, stuff, you're going to be offended. The thing is you learn how to overcome offenses. How many people? Ah, you, know, oh, you know, I gave my life to the Lord. Where do you go to church? I don't go to church because... And they'll tell you they got offended. Well, you dummy. You're supposed to learn how to overcome those offenses. What's wrong with you? I say that in love. Total love. <laughs> dumb. Double dumb. Dumb squared. That's dumb. Thinking you weren't going to get offended by people. People are still people after they get saved. You still do dumb things after you get saved. I do dumb things all the time. And I'm saved. I've been a Christian 45 years. We're on a journey. We're on this journey together. We're helping each other. You have to learn to overcome offenses and how to deal with offenses. That's what church is about. That's what church teaches you. How to deal with the offenses as they come up not have this unreal ex expectation that everybody's going to be perfect because you don't think yourself and you don't hold yourself to that standard if you make a mistake what do you say well I'm not perfect well duh yeah but why do you think everybody else is supposed to be perfect you're going to get offended in church you're going to get offended driving down the road you're going to get offended at work you're going to get offended at home in your family yeah, just write it in your notes you're going to get offended it's just all about how you deal with offenses. It's not, and that's why the devil is trying to cut people off from their source of strength and help and blessing and fulfillment in life because you are fulfilled when you're using your gifts to help others know God. And so he wants to cut people off from church. And uh, you come to church to learn how to overcome. You come to be healed of your past hurts. That's why we have uh, a freedom group. Because you and I both have a stack of hurts from people offending us in life. And it's time to start unstacking them and getting rid of them so that you can have new good relationships because those bad hurts keep you from having new good relationships. You learn how to deal with your hurts in a healthy manner. I have a sheet out there in the lobby. It's called The Seven Characteristics of a Healthy Life. And here's number six. It's in there. The sixth characteristic of having a healthy life is developing life-giving relationships by addressing hurts, wounds, and disappointments as they occur. 
How many people I've talked to and say, well, you know, well, I'm, you know, I'm not serving in that team anymore, or I'm not going to church anymore because so and so offended me, and I say, well, what, what did they say about it? Well, I never said anything to them about it. How's it going to get resolved? You go around telling everybody else, but you don't tell, you don't go back to where the offense happened. That's how it gets worked out. So here's, here's a characteristic of a healthy life. Developing life-giving relationships by addressing hurts, wounds, and disappointments as they occur. Well, I can't do that. Well, why can't you do that? Because you've got all these piled up hurts, so you need to go to freedom groups, so you learn, learn how to get free from those, so that you can start having healthy relationships, or you're going to go through the rest of your life being hurt and wounded and not connect with anybody, never fulfill your God-given destiny, and die and go to heaven and get to heaven, and God's going to say, look at all you could have done, but you didn't do it because you were hurt and you didn't deal with your hurts. Time to deal with your hurts so you can do what you're supposed to do, be what you're supposed to be. It's the devil that's keeping you hurt and offended so that you can't fulfill your destiny. That's his plan. You go to prove that there's something more important than being offended. You get offended and you keep going. Why? Because there's something more important. There's two people that got saved last week because everybody was doing what they're supposed to be doing. That's more important than my offense. What's more important? It's God. It's His will. It's His purpose. It's His kingdom. It's your destiny. It's saving souls from hell. It's seeing life's changes, helping people know God. Church, look, church is not the destination. It's the bridge to the destination. The destination is Jesus. We're here to help you get closer to Jesus. We're, we're a bridge. We're here to encourage one another and you know, entice each other to get closer to God. We're not the destination. A lot of people coming, come to church with an unrealistic expectation thinking the church is Jesus. No, we're not Jesus. We're people. We're the bridge to connect you to Jesus. That's your source. That's your help. That's your strength. That's where you get healed. That's where the answers come. They come from Jesus, not from the church. We're all imperfect people encouraging one another. Don't quit. Your answer's right around the corner. Come on. Because I've wanted to quit many times, but it's you guys that keep encouraging me and hang in there. And the only way to lose in the kingdom of God is to quit. That's the only way to lose. If you hang in there, stay in there. As Pastor Scott would say, like a hair in a biscuit. Just hang in there, man. Just hang in there. Don't give up. You're going to make it. I love that illustration. Jesus is the source, not people. Jesus is the answer, not people. Church is not your source. Church connects you to the source. Victory Church is not the answer. We're just a bridge. There's many bridges in this town. There's 200 bridges. They're just helping people cross over the difficulties of life and get more close to Jesus. Church is God's invention. It's his tool. It's his body, he calls it. It's his bride, he calls it. It's his army, he calls it. It's his family, he calls it. It's his mouthpiece, he calls it. It's what he's using to reach this generation. It's his bridge to get you from where you are to where you need to be. Because there's some place you need to be that you're not there yet. And the church is here to inspire you to keep moving, to go from where you are to where you need to be. Because there's something more, there's something more, there's something more, there's more for your life. Mm-hmm. The bridge needs you, and you need the bridge. Somebody ought to write a sign, song about that. I need the bridge, and the bridge needs me. What is that song? That comes from something. You need the bridge. The bridge needs you. You need the bridge. You need the bridge. But the bridge needs you because the bridge is made out of people doing stuff, working in the nursery, working in the music group. We're here to fulfill his will and to do his work to reach the lost and encourage one another not to quit. We invest our time, talent, and treasure in something eternal and of eternal value. Earth is passing away. Newsflash! Earth is passing away. How do I know that? The Bible says it. What is science telling us every day? Earth is passing away. That's what it's saying. <laughs> so don't be invested in something that's temporary. Look at this verse, Luke chapter 12. I still got a lot of verses to read, but I'm going to read them fast. Watch this. Jesus, Jesus talking. He said to them, stuff is going to jump off of these words into your life to every one of us to help us today. Beware, be on your guard against every form of greed. Greed is not an amount, it's an attitude. For not even when one has an abundance does his life consist of his possessions. He told them a parable saying, the land of a rich man. Watch this whole parable of the rich man. See how many times God is mentioned in this man's life. Watch this. The land of a rich man was very productive, and he began reasoning to himself, saying, What shall I do, since I have no place to store my crops? 
And he said, this is what I will do. I will tear down my barns and build larger ones, and then I will store all my grain and my goods, and I will say to my soul, soul, you have many goods laid up for many years. Come, take your ease. Eat, drink, and be merry. How many would like to have, be in that place? Oh, I've got it all taken care of. Now I can sit back. Some of us, that's our goal. Ah, sit back, eat, drink, and be merry. But watch what God says. But God, that's the first place God is mentioned in this parable. But God said to him, you fool. Why? Because the Bible says, the fool has said in his heart that there is no God. So all his plans, there was no mention of God. What is God's plan? God's God's will. What does God want me to do? He's all about his plans. My plans, my vision, my dream, my education, my degree, my, my, my. And he says, you fool. This very night your soul is required of you and who will own what you have prepared? So is the man who stores up treasure for himself and is not rich toward God. That is a very sad statement. Imagine working so hard, doing all this stuff, accomplishing all this, but you're rich toward yourself and you're rich toward this earth, and we're, but you're not rich. That's a scary statement right there. Am all I, can I do all this and not be rich toward God? Can, can, I, can I struggle so hard and work so hard? And when I get there, he says, well, I'm going to let you in, but he doesn't say, well done, thou good and... I, that's all I'm living for is, well done, thou good and faithful servant. Good and faithful. And that is, you do that by being rich toward God. By being rich toward God. It doesn't matter how much you have. It's how much, how rich I am toward God. You're going to die. The earth is going to cease to exist as we know it. And every man will stand before God and give an account of our life. And what you need to do, I'll just put it out there for you, is to be rich toward God. It's the only thing that's really valuable in life is being rich toward God. Well, how do you be rich toward God? So we're talking about your heart, putting your treasure in the kingdom of God. Keep reading. And do not, and Jesus is still talking. Do not seek what you'll eat and what you'll drink. And, and don't keep worrying. A sign of that I'm living for myself is that I worry. For all these things the nations of the world eagerly seek, but your Father knows what you, that you need these things. But watch this. But seek His kingdom, and these things will be added to you. Do not be afraid. And what happens? Why do we get afraid? Because we're trying to do it all ourselves and in our own strength. Little flock, for your Father has chosen gladly to give you the kingdom. Sell your possessions and give to charity. <laughs> He's not asking you to sell everything. He did ask one man to do that because that was his God. But he didn't ask Zacchaeus that. Zacchaeus said, I'll give half. And Jesus didn't say, half's not enough. No, he said, yeah, you, today salvation has come to this household. Peter still had a house and a boat. All the disciples still had stuff. But what he's saying is, are you, being, are you investing in the kingdom of God? Sell your possessions. Give to charity. Make yourselves money belts which do not wear out. An unfailing treasure in heaven. How do you be rich toward God? How do you lay up treasure in heaven? Put your heart. Your heart follows your treasure. Put your treasure in the house of God. Your heart will be in the house of God and you will not be disappointed. In heaven where no thief comes near nor moth destroys. For where your treasure is, look at this, there your heart will be also. I'm going to read the rest of this passage because it's going to help you all. We're going to be thinking about it. Be dressed in readiness. This is for every one of us. Keep your lamps lit. Be like men who are waiting for their master. So easy to get caught up in the busyness of life. The stuff You're waiting for your master when he returns from the wedding feast so that they may immediately open the door to him when he comes and knocks. Blessed are those servants whom the master will find. We're on the alert. Well, I'm not in church because I was offended. You're not on the alert. You're not serving. You're not at the bridge. You're not helping. Be on the alert when he comes. Truly I say to you, he will gird himself to serve and have them re recline at the table and will come up and wait on them whether he comes in the second watch or even in the third watch and he finds them so blessed are those servants. What servants? The ones that are working in the nursery. The ones that are making the coffee. The ones that are out in the parking lot. The ones that are greeters. The ones that are ushers. The ones doing something to advance the kingdom of God. That's the servants. That's how you stay on the alert. You don't get to, this, well, I've been doing this long enough. No, no, no. Keep investing in the kingdom. Be sure of this. If the head of the house had known what hour the thief was coming, he wouldn't have allowed it to be broken into. You too be ready for the Son of Man is coming in an hour. You do not expect him. When's he coming? I don't know. If I, if I could tell you, he wouldn't have come then because you can't expect it. I like this saying, plan like he's not coming for a hundred years, live like he's coming today. Peter said, Lord, are you addressing this parable to us or to everyone else as well? And here's what he said, who then is the faithful 
sensible steward. And this is what I'm asking you today. Ask yourself, am I faithful and sensible steward? What are you a steward? What is a steward? A steward who has been given somebody else's resources to manage. That's your money, that's your time, that's your talent, that's your body, that's everything that you have has been given to you by God. You are a steward of those things. Whom his master will put in charge of his servants. You've been, you say, oh, that's not me. Yes, it is. If you're in the nursery, you're in charge of his servants. If you're a greeter, you're in charge of his servants. If you're in the worship, to, in charge of his to give them their rations at the, por- at the proper time. Blessed is that servant whom his master finds so doing when he comes. Not that you did it for a while and you got offended and you quit. Come on. Truly I say to you that he will put him in charge of all his possessions. You know there's going to be responsibilities in eternity for me and you. Do you have a heart for the house of God? For his children? For college students? For young people? For the lost? For the broken? Do you have a heart? We have to ask ourselves. Do you have a heart to honor God? Worship honors God. Giving honors God. Giving your time, your talent, and your treasure. I want to to say today for every one of us is is not to condemn you, but to ask us in our prayer time, Lord, how am I doing? How am I doing, Lord? How am I doing? Could I do better? Could I have a a bigger, a better heart? Could I invest more of my heart in the kingdom of God? And I'm going to just encourage you, have a heart for God's house. So Two questions, they're in your notes at the back, I'd like you to ask yourself. Number one, what can I give in the Christmas offering? Just ask you, I'm not going to tell you. I told Rebecca when we started church, I said, two things I'll never do is beg or pressure people to give. I'm just going to put it out there. Here, we have a need. We need to pay for this building. Put it out there. And you just pray and do what God tells you to do. I'm not going to tell you what to do. Two things, two questions I'd like you to ask yourself. What can I give in the Christmas offering? And two, Am I giving God my best right now? I'd like like you to ask yourself that. Take your notes home with you. I I just ask you every day this week when you get up and pray, look, read this question and say, am I giving God my best right now? If you're not, when's it going to change? How's it going to change? It's not going to magically change. If I'm not giving God my best, if I'm worried and if I'm afraid, then it's an indication that I'm relying too much on myself and I need to put more of myself in trusting God. I'm going to ask you to ask yourself two questions. What can I give and am I giving God my best right now? Am I seeking first His kingdom of God? What's the kingdom of God? I've been telling you this, let's put it very simply. Kingdom of God is number one, knowing God. That's your first priority in life every time you get up every day. Knowing God. Invest in knowing God. Knowing God. Knowing God. Nothing works if you don't do this first. Knowing God. Knowing God. How much time, effort, resources do you invest in knowing God? Where do you spend your money? Do you buy books that help you to know God? Do you listen to videos and watch podcasts that help you to know God better? Or do we, not that you can't do other things, but I'm asking, what about our priorities? Kingdom of God is knowing God. And number two, helping others know God. How am I helping others know God? What am I doing to help other people know God. I can't just sit back and let other people do it. This is how we're going to be judged. This is what we're going to be judged for. Am I knowing God? Am I helping others? Are you laying up treasure in heaven? Let's just pray. Let's just, uh, God, help us. I want to do better. I, I, I want to do better, Lord God. I want to do better with my life. I, I hope that's your prayer. I hope that's your prayer today, Lord. How could I do better? How could I, how could I live better? How could I give you more? Lord, I just... Ask, we just ask ourselves, where is my treasure? Where is my heart? Lord, do you have my whole heart? Is, is there part of my heart that I'm holding back? That I don't want you to see? That I don't want you to look into? That maybe, maybe there's a little door. Behold, the Bible says, behold, I stand at the door and knock. Jesus says that. What door is he knocking on? He's knocking on your heart. You know what? He wants to get in every area. Is there some closed doors where you're afraid to let him in? We're just praying. I'm just trying to help you. If you let him in, you'll never regret it. He'll change it for the better. Sometimes we're afraid. Oh, God, he he already knows everything. Just let him in. Let him in that area of your life. Are you giving him the best of your day? Just pray. Lord, am I giving you the best of my day? When, When am I best? When's the best time for me to spend time with you? Are you giving him the best of your energy? The best of your love. Or just speak to every one of us. Just just a small change, a small course correction that we can make. 
Maybe it's 15 minutes in the morning. Maybe it's 15 minutes at night. Maybe it's 15 minutes at lunch. Maybe, I don't know, five minutes, 10 minutes, half hour. I don't know. Speak to us, Lord. It's a small change we can make to get closer to you. And to be sure that when we get to heaven, we hear, well done, good and faithful servant. Enter into the joy of your master. Right now, with every head bowed and every eye closed, I got a very important question for you, and that is this. If you died tonight, would you go to heaven? If you died tonight, would you go to heaven? You might be here, you say, I don't know. I think so. I hope so. I'm really not sure. Well, that's a pretty important consequence to not be sure about. You say, yeah, but does anybody know? Can, can you really know? Yeah. The Bible says, I've written to you that you may know that you have eternal life. Well, how do you get eternal life? Someone asked Jesus that, and here's what he said. He said, you must be born again. Going to church doesn't make you a Christian. Having Christian parents doesn't make you a Christian. You have to be born again. That simply means there comes a moment in your life, you surrender your life to Christ. You ask him to forgive your sins. He comes, he lives inside of you, he makes you into a new person. That's it. That's how it works. You're born again. It's an act of your will. Maybe you've never done that. Maybe you're here today and you say, I did that in the past, but today I'm not where I want to be. If either one of those apply to you in just a moment, I'm going to lead you in a prayer. You can take that step of faith today. And I'm not going to ask you to stand up or come forward, but every head bowed and every eye closed. If you want to be sure, if you die tonight, you go to heaven and you want to trust your life, you can trust him. Just slip up your hand right where you're at. I'm going to lead you in a prayer. Slip up your hand. Say, that's me. I'm ready. I'm ready to surrender and give my life to Christ. I want to be sure if I die tonight, I won't go to heaven. Or you want to get back on track. Anybody else? Anybody else? Put your hands down. I'm going to lead you in a prayer. Everybody help them pray this prayer. Dear Jesus, I believe you're the Son of God. I believe you died on the cross for my sins. I believe God raised you from the dead. I'm a sinner. I need a Savior. Can't save myself. Dear Jesus, please forgive all my sins. Come live on the inside of me. Make me into a new person. Wherever you lead me, I'll follow from this day forevermore. Right now, I'm born again. I'm saved. I'm a Christian. Thank you, Jesus. Jesus is my Lord. Give the Lord praise. People prayed that prayer meant business with God. Well, listen, if you prayed that prayer for the first time on your connection card, there's a little box, and if you check that box, I'm going to send you some special materials in the mail. Uh, also, at the end of the service, we're going to have prayer teams up here to pray with anybody that needs prayer. If you don't have a Bible, we'd love to give you a Bible and put your name in it. Don't forget to put your connection card in the offering basket as it comes by. Here's my offering scripture. We already read it. Bring the whole tithe into the storehouse that there may be food in my house. Bring the whole tithe. And what does he do? He says, I will open the windows of heaven and pour out a blessing till it overflows. There's three ways to give. You can give in the offering basket by using the envelope. You can also go online through the website where you went earlier to sign up for the Christmas party. I'm looking forward to the Christmas party. How many are you looking for? Man, that's going to be great. It's going to be so much fun. Or you can text to give and there's information about that. If you want to give to the Bahama Relief, mark that. If you're giving to the Building Fund, mark that. Or Heart for the House, uh, you can mark that. And let's pray over our offering. Father, we thank you for this opportunity to give into the kingdom of God. Good seed and a good soul. ask you to take these gifts, multiply them, make them do more than we ever thought they could do. I ask you to give back to the giver a hundredfold return, which you promised your disciples. And right now, I speak this blessing over your people that you commanded Moses to speak over your people years ago. I say they were blessed coming in, they're blessed going out. In the city, in the country, in their home, in the field, when they lie down, when they get up. Blessed is their bread and their water, their basket, their bowl, their barn, their bank account, their job, their home, their car, their animals, everything that they have. I command the blessing of God upon them. I say if the enemy comes against him one way, they'll flee seven ways before their face. No weapon formed against them shall prosper. Every tongue that rise against them in judgment, they'll condemn with the word of God. They're the head and not the tail, above and not beneath. They'll lend and not borrow. In all they put their hand to, they'll prosper. I call increase into God's people. Spiritual, emotional, physical, financial, social increase. Blessing from every direction. Opportunity to lay hands on the sick and see them recover and lead people to a saving knowledge of Jesus Christ. In Jesus' name, everybody agree with that said? Amen. Amen. God bless you.